Welcome everyone, Kostin here with my essential unit guide for Kislev and Total War Warhammer 3 Immortal Empires, covering the units, lords, and heroes that you should be using in every single campaign. Let's start with Tier 1. From any Tier 1 settlement, you can recruit Kossars. They're a hybrid melee ranged unit, though their melee ability is just not that great. They're a one handed infantry unit without the shield, so they're kind of bad. They're low armor and relatively weak stats in melee means that they're just not going to do very very well over there. Their main role however is range. They have decent amount of range at 140 range with 17 missile strength but they do struggle against armor which is a particular problem for Kislev given the fact that you are likely going to be dealing with a lot of warriors of chaos. But if you are uh, playing as Kislev then Getting a bunch of Kossars, recruiting them from any settlement is a really sound strategy. And in fact, it's something you're going to do if you're playing Borosaurus, if you're playing Katrin. Less so if you're playing Castalton, because he does start with a tier 2 settlement. But even as Castalton, you're likely going to recruit at least some Kossars in your campaign. Then, from a tier 1 barracks, you have the ability of getting Kossar Spearmen. These guys are basically your fr uh, flank protectors, and surprisingly enough, Kislev doesn't really have that many infantry choices that are good against lords. So if you're dealing with a bunch of fast movers, if you're dealing with a bunch of flankers, then these guys are your unit of choice early on in a campaign. Otherwise, the exact same stats as the regular Kossars. Less armor piercing. Uh, to be clear, like less armor piercing under melee attack, so we're looking at uh, 7 armor piercing for the regular Kossars. Kossars with Spearmen only have 5, but they do have 15 bonus versus large. Moving on uh, to tier 2, you get Kossars, armored Kossars with grey weapons and uh, armored Kossars, just regular armored Kossars. The difference between these two units is that the shielded version gets a silver shield, which uh, blocks 55% uh, of small arms missile fire from hitting them, whereas the armored Kossars uh, forgo the shield and instead go for a two-handed weapon, which means that the majority of their melee weapon damage is going to be armor-piercing damage. Both of them have pistols with a relatively decent amount of damage to them, but keep in mind that they are fairly short range, so you're not really going to get too many shots off with those pistols. Um, instead, the main role for armor Kossars is to be your melee front line. I'd say a combination of these guys, like four uh, armored Kossars with shields and four armored Kossars with gray weapons is probably the go-to method. Depends on what you're dealing with though, if you're fighting a lot of Warriors of Chaos then you might even forgo the regular armored Kossars and instead go for gray weapons because Warriors of Chaos don't really have that many ranged options and instead go for full-on melee. In that case, the uh, armored Kossars with gray weapons are your unit of choice, but a combination of them. The benefit that these guys have, beyond have being a fairly sturdy, a sturdy front line in a uh, field battle, is also the fact that because they are at a high level of armor and pretty good leadership, they will actually do relatively well in Hot Resolve, as opposed to regular Kossars, which just have 15 armor. One of the things I one of the things I do want to mention about these guys is that they don't have any kind of charge defense or anything like that, so they're kind of lacking in terms of being able to deal with cavalry. Don't try and use them against cavalry. I've learned that lesson the hard way too many times already, because they just won't handle themselves very very well. They're more against infantry. The problem is they're not so good infantry, and this is one of the issues that Kislev does have in their campaign, siege tactics. See, the armor Kossars are not good enough units to breach the gates of a castle or fortress and just storm through them and kill everything in sight. So your siege tactics involve using a lot of regular Kossars and killing everything from range, but you don't have any way of dealing with the wall towers or breaking through uh, the walls. It is a weakness of Kislev. So while you do want to balance army for field battles, for sieges, a bunch of regular Kossars are actually going to be more effective. Keep that particular aspect in mind. Moving on to tier 3 infantry, we have the Tsarguard. Same idea as with the armor Kossars, though the Tsarguard forgo the crappy pistol and instead just go for full of our barren melee stats. So if we compare them, we get more HP, we get more leadership, we get more armor, we get more melee attack, more melee defense, a bit more weapon strength and a bit a very very tiny amount of charge bonus. But Sargard are pretty effective units in a fight. 
And what's interesting to note about Kislev, it for all the hybrid units that it has, some of the more effective units that Kislev does have are actually the straight up uh, dedicated ones. So, for instance, the Tsar Guard are the are the mainline infantry unit that Kislev does want to use in our in their campaign. Same principle as with the armor Cossars, the shielded version have a silver shield, 90 armor. It's kind of interesting when you think about the em Empire versus Kislev because the Empire doesn't have the silver shield. I'm not sure what they're making those sil shields from to have silver shields, uh, but they do. And they also are like we're looking at a unit that can compare to great swords. Let alone the fact like armor Cossars, which are tier two unit, are more heavily armored than pretty much the vast majority of the Empire roster, with the exception of great swords on foot. Yeah, the Empire is in a pathetic state of affairs. But a combination of shielded versions or and great weapon versions is ideal. Though if you're dealing with, again if you're dealing with a lot of warriors of chaos, then you do want to get just the great weapon version. Then you have Streltsy. I will not get too many Streltsy in an army, but Streltsy are a pretty effective gunpowder unit. Uh, heavily armed and armored can do a decent amount of damage. Obviously, they're not uh, as good in melee as the Sargar, but flat out they're better than handgunners that the Empire has, and that's kind of the role they have in a battle. They're the gunpowder unit. They can do, in 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 a lot of ways, they're the best ranged uh, infantry unit that you do have in the case of Arsenal. They're the same range as regular Cossars, but most of their damage is armor-piercing uh, damage. And they also uh, have the, of course, ability to hide in a forest. So they're doing 25 armor piercing damage. These guys can do a good amount of damage, but keep in mind that gunpowder units do suffer significantly right now in Warhammer 3 because of line of sight uh, problems. So if you do get a great line of sight, great, Strelty will do well. If you don't, Sieges, for instance, or a lot of the battlefields you're going to encounter, they're going to be pretty useless. So don't get too many of them. I'd say I'd probably max out uh, at four in any particular army and then just rely like early on, get like four Streltsy, a bunch of armor Cossars, and then some regular Cossars, and then, you know, replace the armor Cossars with the Tsar Guard, and then move on. Moving on for uh, the pr so-called premier range unit of Kislev, which isn't the premier range unit of Kislev, we do have uh, the Ice Guard. Now, the Ice Guard are supposed to be a great unit, but here's uh, some of the problems they do have. They're not doing great armor piercing damage. Yes, they do have magical attacks. Yes, they're melee attacks, or at least uh, uh, like both of them can do pretty solid, uh, pretty solid armor piercing uh, melee damage, in particular the ones with glaives, because they have a lot of armor piercing uh, to them. But while the swords one have bonus versus infantry, and they can slow down enemies in both melee and ranged. The problem is, one, their armor is not that great. So when you look at Sargard, when you look at Streltsy, when you look at armor costers, and then you look at the Ice Guard, yeah, these guys are probably some of the worst uh, in terms of the heavily armored units that Kisov has. Kisov has a lot of heavily armored units. Uh, Ice Guard, which are more expensive than any of these guys, are not so heavily armored, which means they're gonna take significant damage in battle. It's not like they have any kind of missile resistance to help them out, which again is an issue for a missile resist uh, for a missile unit. They're good against demons, if you will, but dem demonic factions aren't the problem on the campaign. It's the warriors of chaos with the human units. It's things like uh, Greenskins or Skaven. So the problem with Ice Guard, if you're facing like legions and legions of bloodletters, sure, they would be good, but they're not, you're not facing legions and legions of bloodletters. You're facing legions and legions of Orc Boys, uh, Greenskin Archers, Night Goblins, Trolls, etc. And against those kind of units, against a lot of those units that many races that you do face in Immortal Empires, Ice Guard are not so great. The way I would view Ice Guard, though, within the role of an army, is more of a support unit. Like, if you're fighting a field battle, then the Streltsy are gonna do a lot more damage, but you can certainly do a combination like four Ice Guard, four Streltsy, and that can be pretty, solid, uh, pretty effective. If you are playing Katrin, you might be you might consider just massing these guys or m making a full stack for Katrin. Don't do that. It's actually not a good army, believe it or not. It might be cheap, but it's not really a great army to use. Like it's better to just have like a combination of Sargard, 
um, Ice Guard Str uh, and Streltsy in an army, like for uh, Fort Sargard, for uh, for Ice Guard, for Streltsy. You get the idea. That's 12 units. And then heroes, artillery, and cavalry, or some kind of cavalry options. Speaking about cavalry options, you do have two different chariots, or sleds, really. You have the light war sleds and then the heavy war sleds. The heavy war sleds are a higher tier unit and much more ex uh, expensive, but they're also substantially better. 600 more HP, 60 more armor, that is ridiculous. They lose 9 speed compared to the light war sleds, but they make up for it in every other department. The thing about these sleds is when you're looking at them, they're, you might think, oh, they're a skirmisher, uh, skirmisher chariot type unit, when they are pretty effective. The thing is uh, in that role, because they have a decent amount of range with them, they do a decent amount of damage, though the reload time is not that great, but they certainly do a decent amount of damage in uh, from their platform and because it is a platform that the gunpowder units are shooting that means they get elevation like let me just compare a unit to Streltsy you can uh, see that the Streltsy unit that's here is at a higher elevation than the Porsche Mux on the ground so that means that these guys that are in the war sleds are constantly going to be able to fire which is pretty useful in general some kind of skirmisher cav uh, skirmisher cav or chariot is pretty effective in a field battle because let's say the you're dealing with skaven they're in the defensive position they're the defender they're not going to attack you and you but you don't want to just rush into the skaven guns that's suicide so using a couple of these skirmisher um cav or chariot units can lure the enemy out and when it comes to kislev this is the role that war sleds have the initial one then they're pretty solid chargers they don't have the best charge bonus like griffin legion will do better but when it comes to getting a lot of units in armies yeah i would certainly go for war slits i mean you can get griffin legion earlier on because you can't get prog pretty quickly but once you get the ability of recruiting light war sleds and heavy war sleds aaron grad looking at you castelton uh, then you will certainly be in a great position in your campaign like these guys like four of these guys throw them in an army there you go you have a pretty powerful army or even two of them if you don't want to micro as much two to four four is obviously more difficult to micro or hell you could make entire doom stacks of these guys and the thing is looking at their melee stats especially for the heavy war sleds they actually will decimate a lot of units in melee because they have a good amount of weapon strength they have pretty solid melee attack and melee defense for a unit of this type and the heavy war sleds with 110 armor yeah they're going to last a fairly long time and crucially they can cause fear so these guys can win against warriors of chaos in fact i would possibly even throw them against chosen i think the meta in multiplayer if i'm not mistaken is to actually rely a lot on these guys compared to like the infantry options or anything else but these are tier 3 tier 4 uh, then you have the little groms the little groms of course the thing about little groms is they suck as a field artillery unit uh, because they're they struggle not necessarily in accuracy I would argue but they struggle specifically like they're firing a big massive projectile and their reload time is well it's not that bad but the issue of I've encountered with little groms a lot of the time is just getting them to fire like ever since I picked up Warhammer 3 when it originally came out I've discovered that little groms are just not that great but they do have an important role siege these guys will destroy walls and wall towers, which is actually something Kislev desperately needs. It is unfortunate that it is a higher tier unit, because Kislev could desperately use these kind of units early on. Funnily enough, they're actually pretty effective in melee as well. Like 105 armor, two bears pulling each little grum. Yeah, you don't want to attack this. Like, they're, like it's kind of hilarious when you think about the lore, because... You think of something like a hell cannon. A hell cannon is not something you want to engage in melee in the lore. Uh, in the game, you don't give a shit because obviously you're not actually fighting the hell cannon as an entity. You're fighting the cow stores pulling it. In game, Kislev has war bears pulling a, an artillery piece. Yeah, don't try engage in this melee. It is a bad idea. You kill it at range, basically. Uh, then we have the war bear riders. Like Kislev has a couple of cavalry choices, but the only one I ever use with exception of like of course the chariots the light war sleds um the only one that's actually worth using are the war bear riders now they're not as good in terms of their charge bonus as griffin legion like griffin legion will decimate never bother with the winged lancers because they're worthless like you can get griffin legion pretty quickly as well 
And don't bother with the light cavalry choices, They're, those are pretty crap. I mean, horse archers could be decent, but not, no, not worth recruiting. In fact, the entire cavalry building chain is not worth building in any case of campaign. Warbear riders, however, are a very, very different affair. See, they have heavy armor, heavy leadership, good speed, good melee attack, good melee defense. The ch their charge bonus is not as good, but most of their damage is armor piercing, and they also have a fairly good amount of bonus versus at large. The bonus versus at large is an anti-cav benefit. So these guys will literally win in a stand-up fight in melee against many units, they'll win against other cavalry, and they can also roam across the battlefield doing a lot of a good amount of damage with their charges. But really, the benefit of the war bear riders is that yeah they're they're a pretty good stand-up melee unit in a fight which means that they're effective in sieges because there are few entities you can actually uh, storm through the gates with quite a lot of these and do pretty well like if you're playing boris ursus you can actually give him an entire doom stack and war of war bear riders and you might be surprised about how, uh, as to how effective that would actually be most of the time, like Kislev, you just want to go for diversity in your roster. But if you're got if you got Orboresources with his upkeep benefit, then yeah, Warbear Riders do work. And then when we're talking about heroes, yeah, obviously both hero choices are really good. When it comes to mages, always go for Tempest Magic. Ice Magic can be useful, but more of in a, in a support role. Whereas the main magic you want to use in a campaign is obviously Tempest. So, and because you do have a limited number of mage slots in your campaign, you almost always want to go Tempest, including for the Ice Witches. Patriarchs, are, of course, are really good heroes. But the thing is, you don't have a choice in terms of like what kind of augment you're going to get, what kind of active abilities. You can choose between Tor, Saliax, and Urson. Uh, no, not Urson, uh, Dash. My perspective on that subject is that if you've got a lot of like, you know, war bear riders, then uh, then say, uh, Saliax can help you with that, or, you know, snow leopards or anything like that, if you want to go for them. I would not necessarily use snow leopards. Some people do make the doomstacks for them work it, uh, worth, uh, worth, but I don't think... Um, I don't think it's wor uh, worth the cost of going for them, like compared to like the infantry blobs that Kisaf has early on, and later on, yeah, war sleds and war bear riders. Uh, so most of the time, I would go for Taurus battle him with the first patriarch in an army. Uh, though of course, Dash and Celia can be useful as well, but you do have to get the choice. In general, with the first patriarch I'm attaching to an army, yeah, I'm going for a uh, Tor. But you can get a lot of patriarchs in a case of campaigns, so, or like the second should have uh, should have Celiax or Dash, dependent on the kind of units you have in your army. Uh, Magic-wise, I would say Biting Wind is one of the first spells you want to get. Of course, the other ones are more support role, but one of the best spells that the ice, uh, that the Frost Maidens do have is the Hawk of Miska, which is a pretty effective one. And speaking about lore choices, you do get the Boyars, Atomans, and Ice Witches. The Atomans are never worth attaching to an army. Let me explain why that is. Technically, you might think, oh, I can get a bunch of bonus skills. Yeah, but you can get those skills anyway by just leveling a Boyar normally, so it's kind of worthless. Oh, but what about the provincial benefits? Well, those provincial benefits, you'll get them passively by having them as Atomans, and, well, they're useful in terms of just keeping a guy in a particular province and not moving him around uh, on the campaign map to fight battles like boyars are going to conquer territory Atomans are there to support economically growth control uh, hero capacity not hero capacity hero crew rank wise in the provinces you already control so never waste an Ataman. One, always go for the skills that give you the economic benefits or the province benefits for an Ataman. Don't get the combat skills, because the combat skills are can be acquired regularly. So even if you do decide to use an Ataman as a lord to lead an army, which I don't think is a great idea, though it might be useful sometimes, it can certainly help you out. But even if you do decide to use an Ataman to, um, to lead an army, maybe it's something to be abused. Um, you always you always want to go for those economic benefits, but most of the time you get you want to get the ice witches, specifically ones with great stats. Like there's ice witches that get uh, minus thirty percent, and this applies to frost maidens. I'm not sure if it stacks, but frost maidens and ice witches can get the same the same traits. So you can get the minus thirty percent upkeep for war sleds, making them achievable. Uh, you can get a control benefit, you can get a missile strength benefit, you can get ice guard benefits, you can get an infantry upkeep benefit, you can get thirty growth. You, it is pretty absurd. 
So usually ice witches are great. And as I said, magic is limited in the case of campaign. You could view it uh, from the perspective that you might want to get a frost maiden on ice, focused on ice as opposed to tempest and get an ice witch on, tem uh, on tempest. But yeah, generally speaking, Tempest Magic is the way to go. My recommendation, by the way, if you're playing Keys of Campaign, Star 1 as Catrin and either Realms of Cast, I believe it works, as well as Immortal Empires, doesn't matter what you do. Level up a bunch of Ice Witches and Frost Maidens through the training, or Star 1 as Castalton, honestly, do the same thing. You might want to have a bunch of them at rank 1. Save them up, save them up, then load them in a campaign where you want to use them. Anyway, that's all there is to say. Costine signing out. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and enable notifications, and stay tuned for more.